Welcome to Hillham Church, and we are glad that we're together to be able to give glory to God and thank Him and, and just be able to celebrate God's goodness. Because he has so much for us to enjoy, uh, so much good uh, for us to receive, blessings and favor. And I was thinking about that this week. Uh, some of you probably in the past have had enjoyment and fun from this little guy, right? You know who that little guy is, right? So, Mr. Potato Head, um, this guy was introduced, really, this is the first toy that was ever advertised on TV. Back in 1952, Hasbro advertised on TV that there would be little parts um, that would be packaged in cereal boxes. And so that's really how it started. Uh, you'd open up a cereal box and there would be this package of little parts, eyes and nose and arms and hats and that sort of thing. And what kids would have to do though, they'd have to go to the cupboard and they'd have to get a real potato. And so they would get those parts out of the cereal boxes and they'd stick them in the potato. And they would make different things with this real potato out of the cupboard. Now, that didn't last too long because parents started complaining about finding old, rotten potatoes, right, in toy boxes and closets and under the bed. And so Hasbro didn't take them long. They created the, the plastic body with the holes in it, and then you get the parts and you kind of do it yourself. And as this guy here, you know, you can... You can have different eyes, and you can have big teeth or no teeth. You can have lots of hair, no hair, or you can put a little hat on him. You can change his arms, and you can just do a lot of different stuff with Mr. Potato Head. Um, and you can do stuff and change him just like that. Now, I'm not going to uh, talk about how you need to to change the way you look or your appearance is like that, although some of you may be thinking, wow, wouldn't it be neat if I could just suddenly, instantly, have more hair, or maybe downsize my ears, or change my smile or something. And as far as I know, you could never make Mr. Potato Head any taller. And so uh, that's kind of the boat I'm in. Um, there are times when I would like to be six foot tall, uh, especially every Sunday morning when I come in here and I start plugging in and turning on the video equipment and the cameras uh, way up there. Um, if I was six foot tall, uh, I could reach those power buttons, but I'm not, so I have to get a stool or a ladder or usually I just climb up on one of those chairs in the back and I hit the power button, but that's, that's okay. That's all right. Um, Every time I go to the doctors for a, a physical or a checkup, they do my weight and my height, and every time I tell the nurse, I'll say, okay, let me guess, I'm five foot 11 and a half again. And, uh, and they're like, they just play along with me. Yep, five eleven and a half steel, and so I don't think I'm ever gonna get any taller. This is it, but that's okay. Today, not going to talk about your physical appearance, anything that you should change, although there's probably some things in our character, in your character, that maybe you do need to change. Some character building where you can just ask God to help you change some things. I'm actually going to be talking about that tonight. I'm not going to talk about that this morning, but tonight we're going to talk about character building. But this morning, I want us to get to a place where we say to God, God, this is how you made me. And I thank you for making me the way that I am. I thank you for creating me in a way where you do have a plan and a purpose that you see me as valuable and important. As we know that God doesn't make junk, right? God doesn't make mistakes, and so He made you exactly the way 
He wanted to make you, and you should know just what the Bible says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And so I want to just, for us, to get to the point where we're able to thank God, say, God, thank you for creating me in the way that you did. And so we're in this series where we're looking at some things that we need to pursue, uh, the things that we need to get right, the, the big rocks that you need to put in your life, because if you don't get these important things in, if you don't get these big rocks in your life, nothing else really matters. Jesus said, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? And so there are some things that we need to get right. There are some important things that the Bible says that we need to make sure that these things are in our life. And so that's kind of what we've been going through. We've talked about wisdom. Last week we looked at loving God. And Jesus said that that's the mega rock That's the biggest rock, the biggest commandment, love God. And then he went on to say, Jesus, and we'll read this passage in just a moment, Matthew chapter 22, but he says, not only love God, but another big rock is loving other people, loving your neighbor as yourself. And so love God, love others, and love yourself. You were created to love God. And then Jesus says, there's, there's some more big rocks that you need to get in your life. Uh, next Sunday morning, we will look at loving your neighbor, loving others, but today it's all going to be about loving you, loving yourself. And so Matthew 22 um, is where we're going to be. And again, Jesus was asked that question. What's most important? What's the most important verse in the Bible? What's, uh, what's the big rock that I need to make sure that I'm doing? What's the greatest commandment? And so Jesus responds to that question in Matthew chapter 22. And beginning at verse 36, says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so Jesus says, love your neighbor how? Well, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so really a clarifier to us from Jesus, he clarifies that and he says, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to love other people, you better start with yourself first. In order to love other people, you need to appreciate and, uh, and be thankful for God, how God has created you. Proverbs 19.8 says, The one who gets wisdom loves his own soul. The one who gets wisdom loves his own soul. Ephesians 5.29 says, For no one ever hated his own flesh. Nobody, Nobody hates their body. But nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. And so there should be this healthy healthy love that you have for yourself. And and I mention that, and I say that on purpose, healthy love, because I think we all know that you can love yourself just a little bit too much. And there can be some problems with that. Uh, Narcissism, arrogance, being prideful, boastful. We know (laughs) how uh, those things are not good. And they can lead you down a road that just uh, that you don't want to be on Paul actually wrote a letter to Timothy talking about that very point how in the last days people will be lovers of themselves more than God and so Paul writes that to me he said you know in the last days 
talking about Revelation and Jesus coming back. In those days, in those times, people's going to love themselves far more than they're going to love God. And it's recorded for us, 2 Timothy chapter 3, the first two verses there, Paul writes and he says, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for people will be lovers of self, They'll be lovers of money. They're going to be boastful, arrogant, slanderers. They're going to be disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and unholy. And so, that's what Paul says. Obviously, when people get all wrapped up in themselves, it's not pleasing to God. The Bible says pride goes before a fall, and and that uh, God opposes those who are prideful. And so that's kind of the extreme negative side of loving oneself. But the other extreme opposite is also bad, uh, something that we call self-loathing, where you kind of beat yourself up. Um, you just don't think that you measure up. You're not good enough. Who am I? Little old me. What can I accomplish? I'm just no good. And so that's the other extreme, low self-esteem. And uh, a lot of times what happens when we have that kind of attitude, we're always comparing ourselves to other people, comparing ourselves to other families, comparing ourselves just to, to whatever. And I think you know how this goes. Um, you see posts or pictures on social media and everything seems to be going awesome for these people that's posting all these pictures and you think wow that's awesome that looks awesome these people are awesome what happened to me you know why am i not enjoying all of this stuff that i see and covers of magazines that just look awesome and and so it's that comparison that we tend to do we see somebody else's perfect vacation. We see perfect family pictures that are out there, perfect whatever, and we think, wow, I'm, I'm not measuring up. My life is not like that, and so somehow I feel inadequate. In the Old Testament, there was a guy by the name of Saul who really, if you read about the life of Saul, he had everything going for him. Uh, the Bible says that he was tall, tallest guy around. He was strong, handsome. Uh, people just flocked to Saul because he was just a leader and had everything going. He was king too, by the way. I mean, this King Saul just had everything going for him. They had a song that they would sing about Saul. They would sing, Saul killed his thousands, right? And so you would think that this guy would have it made. And yet, there was another feller there that the people liked too. A little shepherd boy, young man named David. And Saul didn't like it that the other people liked David too. And David had his own song. People would sing, and they would sing, David has killed his tens of thousands. And that just got to Saul so much that he only had his thousands, David had his tens of thousands, and that jealousy over time just wrecked Saul's life. He, he compared himself day and night to David, and he just convinced himself that he could never measure up. And that jealousy, really hatred, uh, really ruined the life of Saul. The point of all of that is don't let this wonderful truth of how God has created you in the image of God, don't let that wonderful truth um, keep you from understanding and knowing how valuable you really are. You are made in a very special way, and so don't let all of that get squashed by comparing yourself to other people and other things that's going on. God designed you in a way for you to love who you are. And maybe you didn't grow up in that kind of family where people didn't 
you know, say how, how good you are, how great you are, I love you. Maybe you didn't grow up in a, in a, in a, in a house where you were encouraged and, and you didn't hear a lot about how valuable and important you are, but don't let that be an excuse to not understand what the Bible says about how valuable and important that you are, that God created you. Uh, scientists tell us that babies who are even still in the womb, they, they, they hear what's going on around them, and they, they respond to that. I mean, that's, that's at a pretty young age, right? not even born yet and still able to hear and respond. And so how much more important it is for you and I to surround ourselves with people who will be uplifting and encouraging and helpful. Celebrate who God has made you to be. This week we had supper, we was around the table and my young kiddos were there, and so I asked them to say the blessing. And so we do this, and sometimes we take turns. And, of course, at our place, uh, prayer time, well, you know how it might end up. But we started out, Zachary started saying grace, and simple prayer. Uh, Easton kind of chimed in, too, just simple prayer, like a prayer that you would say before a meal. God, I thank you for this food. Uh, I think Easton said, God, I thank you for this day. Just a simple prayer. But then McKenna, she piped up and she said, God, I thank you for me. <laughs> and we kind of we laughed at that. I was like, who says that? I mean, who says, God, I thank you for me? We just don't do that, but I started, after I laughed for a little while, and the boys were on the floor laughing, I thought, you know what? That's a good prayer. That's a good prayer. We should be thanking God. God, I do thank you for me. Thank God. And, and so, and especially at a birthday, right? We've got, uh, we've got birthdays coming up this week. I don't want to point anybody out, but uh, if you've got a birthday this week, or whenever your birthday rolls around, after somebody in your family fixes you a nice steak dinner or whatever it is, fixes you dinner, you say the prayer and you say, God, I thank you for this food, but God, I thank you for me. And that's a good prayer. Maybe even before we leave today, maybe at our closing prayer, you can just spend just a second and say, God, I do thank you for me. And I thank you where you've put me, and I thank you to the people around me. And so, God, I thank you for me. Uh, real quick, I just want to look at some, some real simple reasons why you should be thankful how God has created you. Number one, God has created you unique. There's nobody like you, nobody else in the world. You are the only you, and nobody like you. Even identical twins. Scientists tell us that identical twins, they are not identical. That there are chromosomes and there are DNA, just billions of different things that work to make us all different. And of course, we don't need scientists to tell us that. David told us that in Psalm 139. All you have to go, Psalm 139, David was sitting around and he was thinking about how great and how awesome God is. God, you know my every move. You're around me. Your presence goes with me. When I lie down, you're there. When I get up, you're there. When I go outside, you're there. When I come back home, you're still there. And so David was amazed at God. And he says this in Psalm 139, 13 and 14. He says, God, you created my innermost parts. You wove me together in my mother's womb. I will give you thanks because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. And so David says, God, you put me together. You created me in your image. That's awesome. I mean, that's just amazing. And David was in awe at how much God loved him and how he created him. And this is coming from a guy, David. I mean, <laughs> you think about David's life. His own dad, his own dad didn't even invite him to be in the mix when they were selecting 
the king. You remember the story? The prophet Samuel, God sent Samuel to go to David's house, the house of Jesse. And God told Samuel, one of Jesse's sons, they're going to be king. So I want you to go there and I want you to anoint one of those boys to be king. And Samuel gets there and sure enough, one by one, Jesse sends his boys out, and Samuel looks over them. Nope, not this one. Nope, not this one. He goes through them all, and he says, it's none of these boys. He says, do you got any other boys? And Jesse's like, uh, no, no, that's, <laughs> that's it. That's all of them. And then he says, oh, I forgot all about David. I do have a shepherd. He's just tending the sheep. I'll go get him. How would that make you feel? How would that make you feel that your own dad, your own dad didn't think enough of you to invite you to your own coronation party? You were just overlooked. I mean, that's tough. That's tough coming from parents. And yet David was saying, you know what? My mom and my dad, they might have not have thought that I was all that. They might have ignored me and kind of overlooked me, but God didn't. God knew me, and God knows me, and God loves me, and God created me, and there's nobody else like me. And so David understood just how awesome it was to be made by our Creator. The second thing that we need to, uh, to know that will help us to say, God, I thank you for me, is knowing that God has made you valuable. The thing about how valuable something is is always determined by how much something, somebody's going to pay for it, right? That's what determines value. Um, the more somebody is willing to pay for something, the more it's worth and the more it becomes valuable. Um, if I were to ask you, I've got a $5 bill, I'm not, how, not sure how I was able to keep that all week, but uh, how much would you give me for a $5 bill? Anybody give me 10 bucks for it? <laughs> no, nobody. You're going to give me 5 bucks, right? Because that's, that's all it's worth. $5 bill is worth 5 bucks. Not going to give me any more because it's not worth any more. I was looking, I did a little research trying to find some things that were just crazy valuable because of what people pay for them. And I ran across fish, like fish in an aquarium. Now, I have three goldfish and I think I paid 99 cents a piece for them. And you may say, you know what, that's too much. I'd never pay 99 cents for a fish in my life, and that's fine. But I paid 99 cents, but I saw uh, that there's a fish that you can put in your aquarium. It's called a platinum arowana fish. It's kind of blue, but it's about like that. And that dude sells for, how much would you pay for it? How about $400,000? So just short of half a million dollars for a fish. Ultimately, it's going to be flushed down the toilet, right? I mean, basically, you're flushing down $400,000 at some point. Might be a week, might be a month, might be a year, but eventually that dude's going down the toilet. Four hundred grand. And then so I saw some other things. I saw uh, a pair of slippers. Uh, of course, I'm not buying any slippers. Guys, you're probably not buying any slippers, but there was some ruby, ruby red slippers. Um, the original replica of the ones that Dorothy wore on The Wizard of Oz. Uh, of course, these have diamonds and, and rubies, but how much would you pay for a pair of red slippers? Nothing, right? Some of you, I'm not paying anything. I'm not paying 99 cents for them. $3 million, $3 million, and you say, well, I mean, somebody's paying for it, so that's what they're worth. That's the value of those slippers, $3 million bucks, because somebody's willing to pay $3 million for slippers. The last one I saw, real quick, was a self-portrait of Rembrandt. 
right? Just a, a picture that you would hang in your living room. How, how much would you be willing to, to pay for a portrait of, of Rembrandt to put in your living room? And this is the portrait where, I don't know, you've probably seen it before. It looks like he's got a skunk hat on. But how much would you be willing to pay? Nothing. So some of you are saying, I'm not paying anything, right? I'm not paying anybody, anything for a guy that's got a hat like that on. $30 million. $30 million. So something's worth is measured by how much someone will pay for it. And so what are you worth? <laughs> what are you worth? You're worth what someone is willing to pay for you. And so I've got good news for you. <laughs> good news. The Bible says that you are valuable, that you're worth a bunch. All you have to do is turn to John 3.16. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, that's you, for God so loved you that he gave his one and only son for you. That's how valuable you are, that God's most precious gift, the most precious thing that God has, his one and only son, he gave for you. And so that's how valuable you are. And when you come to Christ, you become a son of the king, a daughter of the king. And God says, you're mine. You're my child. You belong to me. And so that's a, our response then is, God, I thank you. I thank you for me. And lastly, and in closing, God made you with a purpose. We've kind of talked about that already, but God has given you a purpose. He's made you like nobody else. You have a skill set, you have abilities, you have talents, you have spiritual gifts that God has given you and, and maybe nobody else. And God says, use those to, to love God, to love others, and to appreciate how God has made you. 1 Peter 4.10 says, each of you, and he's talking about Christian people who have said yes to Jesus. Jesus, I want you to be leader of my life. And so he says to them, he says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve, to love others. Okay? And so if you're a Christian, the Bible promises that you have at least one spiritual gift from heaven. Probably more but you have at least one. And so God said, you've been made for a purpose. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. But you are made with a purpose. And you have value and you have meaning and you're made in the image of God. And God wants to certainly bless you in the things that you do. But he wants you to work supernaturally, not just to go through life and try to get some money and try to get a career and get a family and just kind of exist. I mean, God can, can bless those things, and God does bless those things, and, and money and, and, and careers and, and that sort of thing. That kind of comes with following the things of God. But God has given you a supernatural purpose so that you love God, love others, and where you are able to come to the place where you say, God, I thank you for little old me, uh, just how I am with all of the warts and the wrinkles and all the problems that I have, I still thank you for me because I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and that is the same for you. And I believe God has great things for you, no matter where you're at on your journey with him, just kind of starting out or you're somewhere in the middle or you've been faithful and you've been a follower of Jesus for a long, long time now, God is always able to do some new stuff. And so I would just ask that we open our eyes and our ears, kind of put up our spiritual antennas and just see what God has for us. We've, here we are a few weeks into a new year, a few weeks into January. And, uh, you know, maybe we're just kind of getting our feet and, uh, and, and we're trying to, to do some things, trying to get in a routine, <clears throat> trying to, 
stretch our faith and grow our faith. And there's going to be times when you're going to be tested. And there's going to be times when the enemy is going to whisper and say, you know what, you need to just... You need to quit that. You need to just give that up. That's too much work. That's too much time. You just need to, to, to take it easy. Don't listen to that. You keep on drawing and nestling up as close as you can to the things of God. Get into God's Word. Pray. Know that you're being prayed for. But those big rocks, we have to get in our life. Love God. Next week, we'll talk about loving others, your neighbor. But this one, you've got to get right to. You've got to know how much God loves you and how valuable you are to Him. Because that's what His Word says. Amen? Amen. Everybody has a part to play. Everybody has a part to play. And God has wired you and created you to make a difference to make an impact on uh, lives here in your faith family, certainly in your circle of friends and your family, but really he's made you in a way where you can really impact the world at large. And so um, we just want to continue to thank God for all that he's done. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who paid the ultimate price for us so that we wouldn't have to pay the price of sin, Uh, that you did that for us on the cross and through your death, burial, and resurrection. You give us the victory that we just have to say, you know what, I'm making you leader of my life. I believe and I have faith and I'm trusting in you. So Father, we ask that you go with us. Help us before we leave, maybe even today, where we just say, God, I thank you for me. And I thank you for how you've created me. And I want to do the things that are pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Go ahead of us now. Continue to guide, guard, and direct us. We love you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.